Welcome to the Plant-Based Spoon, a SPIN special edition report on the state of plant-based food and beverage. We're so thrilled that you're able to join us today. My name is Pratit Spencer. I lead the Strategic Solutions Group here at SPINS, and I will be moderating today's uh, discussion. As a note, if you have questions, we will have time for Q&A um, at the end, so feel free to use the chat feature and add any questions you'll have and we'll be sure to address them. Before we dig in, uh, let me give you a little bit of history about SPINS. Uh, we've been around for uh, more than 20 years and really empower brands and retailers with our wellness focus insights to drive meaningful change in the industry. And our core strength is really translating data to knowledge. So at SPINS, we partner with brands uh, to translate data, which is just really simple facts into meaningful insights that can be leveraged to, to accelerate brand success. And given the substantial growth over the last few years, I can't think of a better focus for today's call than the plant-based market. Whether it's assessing the market size, unpacking the new plant bases, or digging into the latest next generation of plant-based categories and brands, we've got you covered today. Leading our discussion today are Jeff Crompton, Manager of Retail Reporting at SPINS. In, in his role, Jeff partners with retailers, distributors, and certification partners on best-in-class solutions. Additionally, we're joined by Casey Farrell. Casey is a senior data product manager and supports our product intelligence team in building attributes like plant-based to help our partners better understand the market. Casey and Jeff, we're so lucky to have you on today's call. We've got four key topics we'll cover today. We'll talk about the evolution and emergence of plant-based trends, the latest sales trends we're seeing, how SPINS assesses attributes across this dynamic landscape, and we'll close out with a bit on plant-based innovation. Now, of course, we wouldn't do this call justice if we didn't highlight what success looks like. What we hope to do for our brand partners is leave you with a few tangible actions that are really designed to accelerate the growth of your business at your key retailers, informed by a stronger knowledge base of what's happening in this emerging plant-based landscape. With that, I will turn it over to Jeff. Um, I'm gonna take over for Tita, if that's okay. Um, so I wanna start on the next slide with the evolution and emergence of plant-based um, and start to talk about uh, where the plant-based diet came from um, and to understand how the term became so popular and where it evolved from. So originally when people chose not to eat meat or other animal products, they followed a vegan or vegetarian diet. Over time though, these diets became more about restriction and what a product is not. It also became a symbol of a greater movement against the animal-based marketplace as a whole. So it became strict, nuanced, and difficult to adhere to and left many who sympathized with the movement feeling as if, as, as if it was an untainable standard. So as a result, it lost a lot of its followers. Consumers don't want to be restricted or feel like they have to abide by certain rules. They want the flexibility to customize their diet based on their health and their needs, as well as to meet their budget and preferences. So that's really where plant-based began. Plant-based emerged via personalization and the ability to swing the dietary pendulum back toward plants and especially nutritious plants, while still allowing for those aforementioned freedoms. Plant-based foods are more about what a product is, and a plant-based diet allows the option to eat some meat or animal products so consumers don't feel stuck without any freedom to choose. This way of eating allows people the ability to feel like they're making a step toward improving their health or helping the environment without taking a stance against an industry as a whole. So once plant-based foods came onto the market, people began to seek them out for a few different reasons, one of which being because of the nutritional benefit. In fact, more than 70% of people view protein from plant sources as healthy, whereas only 40% view protein from animal sources as healthy. There are a few key differences to call out when looking at plant-based foods versus those from an animal. Plant-based foods can be lower in saturated fat than animal-based foods, and foods from plants are typically higher in fiber and unsaturated fats. So these are both characteristics that are considered healthy options for 
both the general population, but then also are really good key components of a heart healthy diet. Plant-based products, however, may not contain all the essential nutrients found in their animal counterparts. So for example, alternative milks do not have as much calcium or vitamin D as dairy milk. And particularly for people who are lactose intolerant and can't consume dairy, they're interested in purchasing a product that offers the same benefits as drinking dairy milk. And because of this, brands are fortifying their products in order to measure up nutritionally. So when a person chooses a plant-based product, they're not sacrificing anything nutritionally. In addition to fortification to mimic their animal counterpart in order to compete in the flexitarian space, plant-based products are supplementing with added beneficial ingredients and nutrients to surpass animal-based items. Brands are adding superfoods or more protein sources. So they not only match up, but are going above and beyond in terms of their nutritional profile. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later and see some examples too. So to gain a more comprehensive understanding of the plant-based segment, SPINS offers three solutions to dive deeper into product categorization and positioning with our specialty hierarchy structure and our shopper-centric attribution. SPINS offers exclusive plant-based categories and subcategories within our hierarchy to provide retailers an easy way to quickly identify core segments of the plant-based market. So we have four categories and 41 subcategories to narrow in on the specific subsets of the market that are alternative to traditional products like cheese, meat, poultry, and milk that we divide by storage type, as well as in quickly growing subcategories like ice cream and yogurt. This granular segmentation provides unparalleled insights into an ever-changing and evolving market. And SPINS also offers two attributes to further identify different types of plant-based products. The diet attributes overall leverage the nutrition fact panel and ingredient statements to tell us what products are compatible or friendly to a particular diet or way of eating. These diet attributes are ideal for retail solutions such as e-commerce product filters, shelf tags, and product assortment management. The care should be taken when leveraging these attributes for sales trends. This is because these attributes capture all products that qualify for the particular diet, not just products that are labeled or positioned for that diet. The amount of products that qualify for a diet typically far exceeds the amount of products that are labeled or positioned for a particular diet. Also, many products inherently qualify for a particular diet, like all olive oils would qualify for our keto diet attribute. The plant-based diet attribute evaluates the ingredient stream of product and identifies any type of animal-derived ingredient within the product. It's specifically designed to help shoppers adhere to a more rigorous form of plant-based eating across the entire store. On the other hand, the intent of positioning attributes is to capture the market position of a product by blending fact-based label information with marketing claims. So these attributes are used to identify the target audience of a brand or product by identifying the age, gender, health focus, and persona that the product is marketed toward. So our plant-based positioning attribute identifies products within key categories that are direct alternatives of meat-based categories like meat and milk alternatives. These products though may still contain certain ingredients that are animal derived, such as a meat-free nugget that has egg white in it or a veggie burger that has some dairy-based cheese. These products are positioned as plant-based alternatives to meat, are found in our plant-based subcategories, are an important part element when considering the entire spectrum of the various forms of plant-based eating. These two attributes, on top of our differentiated hierarchy, illuminate opportunities into a highly innovative and dynamic marketplace while staying relevant with shoppers. In the next section, my colleague Jeff Crumpton is going to show you how you can use our categorization attribution to illuminate and delve deeper into our plant-based sales trends. AC, thank you so much. I appreciate it. First off, I want to review quickly our data sourcing and methodology. We'll see that we have some point of sale data that we're leveraging. Um, the natural enhanced channel is spins proprietary. The multi outlet um, is through our partnership with IRI and gets at all those conventional um, food, drug, and mass type outlets. You'll see that we also use some um, POS data, and this is a bit of a kind of a first look at. Um, some additional trends that we can kind of layer on top of our projected channel. You know, we wouldn't be looking at plant-based without all the phenomenal work we're doing with our product attribution. So it certainly that gives us the spins lens that we're looking at today. And of course, we're gonna pull in some panel data um, to be able to kind of set the stage around what consumers are looking for. Through the panel and data loyalty work, we learned some very interesting facts about plant-based consumers and their behavior during this pandemic. In particular, we decided to look at refrigerated plant-based meat alternatives. 
32% of households purchased in the eight weeks through 419 were new to this category, meaning they hadn't made a purchase in the prior 52 weeks. New buyers contributed $41 million to the category as households made an average of two trips in those eight weeks, spending on average $16 for products that were not part of their routine shop. Opportunities exist to convert these triers into loyal franchise buyers. Next slide, please. Ooh, I'm sorry, back up one. There we go, sorry. Um, in the next four week period ending 517, 30% of new buyers returned and purchased again, increasing their buy rate to about 20 bucks and making true two trips in the latest four weeks. More new meat substitute buyers were purchasing meat um, at that eight week 419 date. Um, distinct differences between existing and new buyers, both were higher income households with kids that over index for African American households, but the existing buyers are more likely to be Gen X with teenage children. The new buyers brought in since COVID are slightly younger, smaller Hispanic families that are also over indexed for Asian and acculturated Hispanic families. The female head of those millennial households is more likely to work full time in a white collar position. And taking it one step further, we can see that the subset of those new buyers who have come back and repeated in May are more likely to be headed by a single parent with a high income, possibly looking for quick, healthy meal solutions. Next slide, please. So for doing some level setting around the growth of plant-based, first at the very top, you'll see that we're looking for in 52 weeks as a bit of a comparison. And at that very top, we're looking at all food and bev categories at 15% and nine respectively. If we looked at that spins lens, the NPI, natural product industry, you can see that sales have ticked up, that growth rate has ticked up a couple of points at the four in the 52 week. But when we look at plant-based category growth, you can see that we're almost double the growth rate. And that is actually accelerated at the four week um, as opposed to the 52 weeks. That's really exciting news for the plant-based marketplace. Next slide, please. So when we're looking, you know, if you think back to what Casey said, you know, we have two, two of these plant-based attributes, diet on the left-hand side, and you can see some of the categories Again, there are four and 52 week trends. You know, again, there is a caution making sure they're not looking at growth rates because a lot of these can be um, you know, uh, looked at differently than how we look at our plant-based position products. And then of course, on the right-hand side, you'll see those that have that plant-based positioning. These are products that are exclusively called out on the packaging. Um, you know, or in some other way that really kind of uniquely qualifies them as being plant-based. And you can see, for example, um, some of those have some, some quite high growth rates. Really what we're looking at kind of between the two of these is in many cases, the four week trend has actually grown faster than if we look at that longer time frame of 52 weeks. Next slide. So now on this slide, if I divide this into two parts, kind of center left is going to be everything that we're looking at from a category on mainstream meat analogs. So you'll see kind of the usual suspects of frozen bacon and seafood and poultry cuts, hot dogs, hamburgers, and then center right, you're gonna see those um, plant-based equivalents. Now the one thing that I will point out is when, you, when you're noticing these, um, these, these bar graphs, you'll see that the growth rate, the small bubble, is still within the 20 to 30 percent range when we look at the meat analogs, and that has a lot to do with what we saw with COVID. But what we're seeing kind of center right is going to be the growth rate for this plant base, which has absolutely exploded um, over the past year and more recently in the near-term view. We actually had to put this slide um, the, the growth rate on the secondary axis so that we could get everything on there. And one call that would be the plant-based grounds. You can see that growth year over year is um, over 400%. So there's a ton of growth happening in this segment. Next slide, please. So now if we think about plant-based, we're gonna now compare them to their mainstream analogs. So that you'll see on the left-hand side where we have plant-based categories, starting with the largest being refrigerated and shelf-stable milk products. And then we're comparing that to the right-hand side in the blue chart 
to their mainstream analogs. So if I'm using refrigerated plant-based milk as an example, you can see that 22% growth year over year at four weeks compared to the 8% that we're seeing at four weeks for the mainstream analog. Some of that can be longer shelf life. Folks who are stocking up on shelf stable and refrigerated products given longer shelf life with COVID. And so you can, you can kind of see some of the effect that COVID has um, on some of the sales trends there. But if we look down at something like refrigerated plant-based meat alternatives, you can see that 90% growth that we see there. A lot of that has to do with COVID, but then we are in summer grilling season. So a lot of that can be attributed to folks still having socially distanced grilling events with close friends and family, still wanting to grab a better for you responsible option. A another one that I wanna call out is the refrigerated plant-based yogurt and kefir. You can see that growing at 18% and 26% at 52 weeks. However, that category is only growing at three and not quite 1% um, for their analogs. So there's still a lot of innovation occurring in some of these categories where, you know, if we look at it overall, we see that growth is down. Plant-based is a bright spot where we see tremendous growth. Next slide, please. So now we're going to do a bit of a cut between categories on the left and subcategories on the right. And you'll see that we, we have a bit of a mix. You'll see some of the refrigerated plant-based milks. Um, far left-hand side, you'll see what that growth rate looks like, largest in the category. And then if you look over to the right-hand side, you'll see some of the subcategory breakouts. Again, just giving you an idea of the type of growth that we're seeing year over year um, for these categories and subcategories. Next slide, please. Finally, as we kind of think about some of the plant-based plant -based protein options, using functional ingredients is a really great way of getting at some of those constituent parts. You know, soy has always sort of been the mainstay, and you can see that you know, in the four weeks that that has really doubled the growth rate of what we see at 52 weeks. But there are some other ones where we see some of the pea proteins, some of the plant proteins, um, the grain proteins, there's a lot of innovation that's happening across the plant-based segment and functional ingredient is a really great way of understanding some of those underlying dynamics. Next slide, please. And with that, I'm going to turn that back over to Casey. Great, thanks. Um, so talking about innovation and Jeff started to delve into the different types that we're seeing across the functional ingredient, um, there's certainly no shortage of innovation in the plant-based space. And as categories become saturated and new ingredients become mainstream, brands are continuing to look for innovative ways to elevate their products. So the two driving factors behind why consumers are seeking a plant-based diet for health and sustainability concerns are also what are motivating people away from the meat and dairy aisles. Traditional meat and dairy brands therefore are having to become creative and introduce plant-based product lines to compete. Smithfield started their Pure line and Laura's introduced a plant-based line as well as a way to break into the plant-based meat ground segment, both using soy ingredients. While traditional yogurt brands like Activia, Siggy's, and Yoplait's We are diversifying their portfolio of plant-based alternatives using ingredients like coconut and almond. Lifeway now offers a plant-based kefir alternative made from a pea protein solution, and Chobani entered the plant-based space with their oat milk and oat-based yogurts as a way to offer flexitarian consumers options within their brand. These companies are seeing success because brand name familiarity increases the likelihood that someone who is venturing into the plant-based foods realm for the first time will be more likely to purchase the product if they see a trusted brand. As we talked about before, when looking at the nutrition profile of plant-based foods, they don't always measure up to their animal-based counterpart. So we're seeing categories continue to grow and evolve as brands differentiate themselves with their ingredient and nutrition makeup. Protein content is still consumer's top priority and products are adding protein from plant sources like pea or brown rice to reach or exceed their animal-based alternative while limiting carbohydrate and added sugar content to appeal to the paleo or low-carb diet tribes. One of the pioneers in achieving nutritional parity was Ripple, who launched their pea protein plant-based milk with huge success. Their milk is higher in protein and lower in sugar than other alternative milks and is fortified with calcium, vitamin D, and vitamin B12. Their initial success fueled other brands in plant-based milks and across plant-based categories to do the same. So in the plant-based category, there's a prevalence of flexitarian purchases being made. So brands need to compete in what we're calling the protein category of a whole, not necessarily looking at the meat or plant-based meat spaces separately. 
Brands are having to pay special attention to what their product might contain or be missing to make the purchasing decision easier. Additionally, there's a battle going on two fronts with flexitarians as consumers are looking to make sustainable choices when they purchase meat, seeking out brands or products that are organic, grass-fed, and focus on regenerative ag. And more flexitarian consumers are turning to plant-based to meet their sustainability concerns as well as their nutritional needs. There used to be a heavy reliance on sugars as something that many dairy alternatives depended on in the past. Sugar amount was virtually ignored or used to cover off flavors. And some brands relied heavily on the alternative aspect of their product to provide a health halo around their brand. But times have changed and they're competing in a stronger, more diverse market filled with innovation. On top of it, the flexitarian shopper will pick up that lower carb dairy-based product that means sticking to their low carb or no sugar diet. As brands are reducing the sugar content, they're looking to formulate using alternative low calorie sweeteners. The leaner creamer and well well functional beverages pictured here use monk fruit as a lower calorie sugar alternative to appeal to the low carb and keto communities. And a lava dairy free yogurt turns to a blend of both erythritol and monk fruit to achieve its low carb sweetness while remaining an indulgent treat. So brands like Halo Top have also taken this approach and had a lot of success with positioning their products as low calorie or lower sugar options um, of a traditional treat or dessert category. Um, in the other hand though, other brands are sticking to more naturally perceived ingredients for sweetness instead focusing on reducing, instead of focusing on reducing the added sugar content. The Oh My Gelato um, is using the clean label approach calling out only seven ingredients on their label, limiting the use of additives and artificial ingredients. Instead, they add cane sugar and fruit for their added sweetness in their product. So speaking of clean label, um, one of the arguments that consumers have had against plant-based foods is that they are perceived to be more processed. So some products need to add a number of different ingredients to achieve the same texture and taste consumers may expect from an alternative. Brands are now looking to clean labels and formula innovations that allow them to reduce the number of additives in their products or use more natural ingredients like a nut butter, avocado, mushrooms, or oats to achieve the same purpose. Brands like Primal Kitchen, Elmhurst, Lava, and Daring are some of the leaders in this space. They're using real ingredients like herbs and spices rather than the ubiquitous term natural flavor while eliminating added sugar, thickeners, gums, stabilizers, and synthetically produced preservatives. They're also making a point to call out their cleaner formulation on their label, indicating a small ingredient count or making a number of free from claims. So this is really attracting the natural shopper who is evolving the definition of clean label. Innovation also includes expansion into new categories that have been traditionally dominated by animal products or haven't seen the introduction of many plant-based products to date. Pastas and baking mix brands like Ancient Harvest and Birch Blenders are getting a boost in setting themselves apart in categories hit hard by the low carb trend by adding vegetables and plant-based protein sources to diversify their product lines. Adding nondescript vegetable ingredients like cauliflower or substituting vegetables has shifted consumer perception of plant-based and has increased the options in the marketplace. And we've seen innovation in plant-based jerky with dried mushroom and eggplant products, but Akua launched their kelp jerky, appealing to consumers looking for sustainable sourcing. Kelp is also considered superfood, which has been a hotly sought after group of ingredients, especially as consumers are looking to support their immunity right now. The Karima smoothie incorporates superfoods into its product formulation as well, with each variety calling out different superfood functions that may attract a different consumer, looking to customize their diet and address a specific concern. The fastest growing product in shelf stable meat alternatives right now are actually tuna alternatives. With sustainability concerns in mind, people are turning to alternatives in every category, and that includes seafood. Good Catch offers tuna alternative pouches and then frozen items created from a patented plant protein blend of pea, soy, lentil, and bean. They only came onto the market a few years ago, but they've already received great feedback in the vegan and plant-based segments. And those still new alternative seafood options are definitely something to keep your eye on in terms of innovation and growth in the plant-based segment. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Jeff to finish up. Thanks, Casey. Next slide, please. So if you think about some overall insights from what we've discussed today, plant-based is hot, continues to be hot, 
and retailers, brands can work together to make sure that they've got the right assortment, the right approach in store to make sure that the consumers are finding what they need and um, you know, in the places that they're expecting them. There is a solid growth trajectory. We've seen this amplified only because of COVID. We've seen um, near-term growth rates skyrocket from where they had been. They were already on a fast track um, as we entered in 2020 and they've even um, grown exponentially from there. So lots of growth, lots of insights um, still to come there. And from an innovation standpoint, tons of innovation in the space. We, we know about, you know, kind of the tried and true um, milks and, you know, some of the meat alternatives, but there's tons of new innovation happening. So consumers are, are really ripe for understanding what those new products are and are definitely looking forward to, um, to grabbing those and trying them at home. And with that, I will turn it back over to Pratee. Well, thank you so much, Jeff and Casey. Every time um, I hear you all speak about this topic, I learn something new. Um, at this time, uh, we'll open it up uh, to Q&A uh, from uh, the audience. Uh, so I will go ahead and start off with a question um, around vegan versus vegetarian. Um, and so if you are a brand that isn't currently um, not claiming plant-based specifically on your package, but you might be vegan or vegetarian, how do you differentiate yourselves from other plant-based or from plant-based products in the marketplace? Yeah, uh, this is Casey, I can take that one. Um, I think definitely for brands that are already vegan and vegetarian, um, not only are those great claims to call out in the label, um, but you can do other things within formulation um, to incorporate more plants into the products. Um, we were seeing like grain-free pastas are huge right now. Um, and so not only are they gluten-free, but we we're seeing um, products that are using chickpeas and lentils um, to really boost their nutritional density. Um, and that's definitely something that people are looking for. Um, so they're gonna look for added protein content. They're gonna look for added fiber content in specific categories where some of those nutrients were lacking to begin with. Um, but then you can also, use things like um, if you already have like a vegan cheese alternative um, to up the protein content. So like a hip pea chickpea puff um, is a plant-based product, but they're using a vegan cheese to remain in that category. So to make sure that there is alignment when possible. Um, so they would probably very much eliminate a whole segment if they were to use a dairy cheese on their chickpea puff already. Um, even foods like pasta sauces and pizza, pizza crusts are actually sneaking in vegetables. Um, so just using kind of like a pureed, either broccoli or kale or cauliflower um, within those products to up their nutritional content and really differentiate themselves um, over the traditional products. Thanks so much, Casey. That was awesome answer. Uh, the next one is, is a good one. So um, as many of you on the call know, one of SPIN's uh, unique assets is our unique cross-channel visibility of the marketplace, which allows us to see um, not only scale channels, but many emerging trends and innovation channels. Uh, so this question is targeted around that. Uh, have you seen higher growth of plant-based and the natural channel versus uh, kind of mainstream grocery club in mass? Yeah, I can take that. There are definitely some differences between conventional and our proprietary s &E channel, specialty natural enhanced. You know, I, I think that the natural enhance all, has always benefited from a, a huge amount of innovation that occurs. And a lot of that then migrates over to our conventional channels. So if you think about categories like milk, meat, you know, meat alternatives um, and cheese alternatives, not surprising that those are growing at a rapid rate in Lulo. When you get into some of the smaller ones, some of the more innovation that we see around some of the jerkies or some of the yogurts or even in some of the other categories where we may have something like an egg alternative, you know, those really always start out typically in the natural channel and migrate over. Um, and so kind of you get a, a good idea of what's going on, but usually the innovation does start s and &E and move over to me. Awesome. Thanks for that, Jeff. Are there any uh, shelf stable categories that uh, you suspect will um, outpace uh, refrigerated categories post COVID? Um, I, you know, we've thought about 
what we learned with COVID and the stockpiling. And we saw a huge shift to center store for a lot of those categories like shelf stable milk. But what we've seen in the near term is that as things are starting to open back up, um, refrigerated starts to kind of take back over in, in the case of plant-based milk. But I guess my, my caution would be that because of inconsistencies with kind of ro local regulations that there could still be hot spots. And I think that those hot spots will probably still be looking for pantry stocking around shelf stable. So until we're really kind of through this, you know, I, I think that what we saw the first time around will be information that we still will need to be mindful of if indeed there are a second wave or if we see hot spots start to crop up across the country. Great. Casey, I think you sparked a lot of conversation around vegan versus plant-based. So I'm going to combine a couple of questions that are uh, in the chat here. Um, and so this one is around plant-based versus vegan. Um, kind of how clear are consumers around the differences between the two? And then taking that one step further, what are your thoughts on if a plant-based claim would be uh, preferred over a vegan uh, claim on pack? Yeah, definitely. So I think that the consumer perception, it's not that they're not clear on necessarily the differences. I think that they associate vegan with a little bit more of a negative connotation um, from where it's come from, um, just the, historically, um, and how it like represents more of a whole industry um, and like a stance against animal-based products entirely, which I think is where people are, people, consumers, and brands are shying away from using vegan as much. Um, we're still seeing vegan claims for sure and vegan certifications on label, um, but I think more and more brands are moving toward that plant-based approach to be more inclusive of a broader audience. So vegan definitely narrows in on a, on a, on a subset of the population that doesn't consume any type of animal-based product, whereas the plant-based could be someone who is vegan, but could also be someone who's flexitarian um, and have a little bit of meat, but then also is looking for that plant-based product. Um, and so someone who is vegan is very much going to be looking for those vegan claims or certifications to make sure that there aren't any kind of animal-based product in there. Um, and that's where our attribution can help, where we're looking at our plant-based diet attribute is going to be more of that real vegan approach where there are no animal-based products or ingredients in the product, um, where the, whereas the positioning is a little bit more toward that direct alternative approach. Um, so there's definitely a place for both as label claims. Um, but I would say to be more inclusive of a broader audience, the plant-based claim is where we're seeing things head. Great. Thanks so much, Casey. Um, this next question, I'm happy to jump in on if, you, if I, either of you don't have an answer. Um, but uh, there's a question around uh, plant-based product ingredients and consumer behaviors and uh, what spins insights might be available to help brands assess those. Um, so I can weigh in here, uh, you know, we've got some tremendous assets really designed to help uh, brands get better insights around the consumer behavior surrounding plant-based products. Um, so through Consumer Panel, uh, we have a unique segmentation that looks at a specific, uh, that layers in our attributes to assess um, kind of uh, some of the basic consumer metrics around plant-based and like buy rate and purchase intent and repeat rate, uh, really helping brands unpack the consumer behavior um, around plant-based um, in contrast to the animal-based counterparts. We also have some great uh, predictive uh, anal consumer predictive analytic uh, capabilities, which uh, will really allow you to assess kind of more attitudinal consumer behavior around plant-based. And so we'll share some contact information at the end, um, but certainly happy to have a follow-up conversation on that. Uh, next question is around uh, the, the littles, I guess inspired by this cute little picture here. Um, so any insights that either of you can share around uh, plant-based trend as it relates to babies and kids? Um, I can talk, speak a little bit to this. Um, I think that definitely as parents and main shoppers of the household and um, families are following one diet altogether, we're seeing that carried over into baby and kids. 
um, there are certainly different nutritional recommendations and requirements for um, babies and, and children alike. Um, but we are seeing definitely um, an increase in plant-based foods for the younger categories as well. Yeah, and just to kind of build on that, we, you know, one, when we look at the kind of baby food category, not necessarily, you know, for, for kind of the, the younger kind of toddler and under, we saw that we, a ton of sales were leaving that category during the pandemic. So it suggests that, you know, folks are actually feeding their kids um, even as young as toddlers, exactly what they're having at home. It makes perfect sense. Um, so, it, you know, it really does kind of align with what Casey's saying. Um, and I think that that's something we'll probably continue to, to kind of look at, particularly as we're kind of back to school, if that, if that holds or if some of those openings, it, when kids are going back to school, if we start to see the return to some of the kind of constituent ingredients of like lunch boxes and stuff like that. Great. Jeff, wondering if you might have any insights around uh, kind of the ceiling for plant-based. And so uh, the question here is really looking at uh, per a percent of uh, conventional space that might be dedicated to plant-based items in the future. So as an example, if about 20% of, of the uh, categories, does it, uh, the dip category is dedicated to um, plant-based items today. What might that look like in the next few years? Where do you see that going? I mean, we've, we've looked at, you know, with some of our partnerships with some of our, you know, other certification organizations, we've definitely seen where we, um, where we've had a steady growth within the space. And so if it's something like 20% now, then, you know, what we've suggested, it's kind of, you know, ticking off like 25%, maybe 30%, you know, I think that number is probably higher, kind of given where we are right now. I think the one component of that that would be problematic in our current economic kind of landscape is that in many cases, some of these plant-based products are perceived to be higher. In some cases, they are higher from a ring. And I think brands have an opportunity to continue to grow that ceiling if they're smart about what their promotion and pricing strategies are. Um, I think we've seen that folks, you know, when they're reaching for products are still reaching for products that are better for them. If they're at home and if they're sequestered, they're not able to do their same kind of routine. Their diet is still very, very important. Um, but that also means that with rising unemployment, that they're going to be looking for value size. They're going to be looking for, um, you know, private label. And I think that brands would be really, it'd be, you'd be remiss not to consider your price and promo when thinking about what that ceiling can be. Thanks, Jeff. What's going on with tofu these days? Do, do we see any increase in sales there? We did, actually. Tofu was, you know, really benefited from um, a lot of the kind of the meat alternative trends that we saw. I think folks are comfortable with tofu. And I think in many ways, it's always kind of seen, seemed to be a bit, a bit of a kind of a stepchild when we're thinking about it. You know, it's, it, it, it's a constituent ingredient for a lot of recipes. Um, you know, we didn't really kind of look at it because it's really the growth rate has been, um, you know, from a plant-based standpoint, we really want to focus on what we're seeing with the meat alternatives and cheese and some of these other ones. But tofu also benefits from um, the plant-based boom. There are certainly still tons of sales and huge increases similar to what we've seen elsewhere. Great. Um, we'll close out with one final question, which I think is very uh, topical. So just a couple weeks ago, um, Kroger announced um, that they'll be shelving their plant-based items in line uh, with their animal-based uh, counterparts. Um, and as we've talked to retailers over the past few weeks on this topic, we're, we're hearing very mixed answers. Uh, what is, what is uh, your perspective on um, if we'll see a dr drastic merchandising or shelving change as a result of this plant-based boom? You know, I feel like, my way of thinking, I guess, is, you know, we, we saw the great survey come out from Kroger, how they merchandised meat um, alternatives within their traditional meat case. We saw the, you know, the, how well that was received by customers. 
Um, and it makes sense, you know, folks that are looking for burgers are going to go to one section to find burgers. You know, there may be a difference between frozen and refrigerated, but I think that that kind of intent to, to purchase in one area as opposed to having to track it down is intuitive. Um, you know, I've always been kind of skeptical about kind of kind of destination of plant-based elsewhere or any sort of like um, kind of more specific category, you know, if it's having your milk with the rest of your, um, you know, milk alternatives with the rest of your milk. If you have refrigerated condiments or plant-based that you're putting them with the rest of your condiments in your perimeter. To me, it just seems like smart customer behavior. That's where they're looking for them. And I think it benefits, you know, you can do some cross merchandising opportunities, but I think that we'll probably see more retailers take a cue from what we've seen with Kroger and start to institute that across their stores. Awesome. I know there are several questions in the chat around distribution of the deck and we will be sure to get this to everyone on the call. So no worries there. Uh, Jeff, Casey, thank you so, so much for uh, your tremendous insights. Uh, for those folks joining us on the call, we are here to help and support you. So please let us know anytime um, how we can use this information and insights to continue to support the growth of, of your customers and communities and what is no doubt a really challenging time. Uh, at any time, you can reach out to your SPINS account manager or or uh, if you're unsure who that is, you can, we can directly connect you with someone via customer support at spins.com. Thank you so much for joining us uh, and have a great day.